Howdy, friends and floor heads. Happy May Day. And I was thinking about this. I said, you know, the first of May is coming up and, you know, we're supposed to celebrate spring and, and new life. And what a better way than to play survival horror gothic <laughs> game like the Isabel. Now, the first thing you should notice is to my upper left, that is not Vic, <laughs> as you saw in the intro. Uh, we had a bit of a scheduling confusion with Vic, and but uh, because... Nick is Nick uh, with a 15 minute warning, Nick, you came on. So I appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Are you kidding? I was sitting there going, I wonder if somebody's going to drop and I can. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do to Vic? I, yeah, I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So oh, no, for those no. of you that did not watch The Dead House, uh, very quickly, both The Dead House and The Isabel um, are currently crowdfunding on GameFound. Uh, with Bully Pulpit Games. Uh, go check it out. Just search for, uh, just go to Bully Pulpit Games or go to GameFound and search for uh, The Desperation, uh, which is the engine that both of these games use. We've played The Dead House, so you can watch that in um, our Storyteller playlist on YouTube. And it had an impact. Um, we had pretty high expectations for it, and it exceeded them. Um, and I like storyteller games. Um, and quite frankly, uh, Jason Morningstar is the reason why. It was his fiasco that I first came across. Um, and then I played For the Queen, which you actually saw on the channel, and I was hooked. What's interesting about this Desperation Engine is it's a little bit different than anything I've seen before. And, and I wish I was more versed in storyteller games to know just the degree of innovation we're seeing here. But what you're gonna watch us do is instead of us taking the roles of characters, uh, what we're actually going to do is we are going to build this story with characters. And all of us at any point can take control of these characters. And we're going to assign truths to these characters through prompts as well as through our own imagination. And what we found in the Dead House is you end up with this really interesting story that almost feels like you're uncovering history. You almost feel like an archaeologist in a, in a very, very interesting way or a historian, you know, researching things in a library. Um, I will um, put this out uh, first and foremost, though. There's some dark themes in both Dead House and here in the Isabel. Um, so, you know, those of you that potentially have some trigger warnings around um, horror, around uh, suicide, um, around dis uh, body dysmorphia, um, things like that. Just be careful because um, things can get a little dark here um, and I don't want that to catch you by surprise. Whew. All right. I think we should start playing and I'm going to explain <laughs> the game as we go. So first, the setting. The Isabel is a storytelling game about the final voyage of a cod schooner in 1888 and the awful fate of her crew and passengers off the coast of Alaska. A high seas gothic storytelling experience steeped in actual history, which the Dead House was as well. Mm -hmm. Isabel is a dark, lyrical game about people pushed far past their limits. There is um, a really interesting process that we're going to go through. I'm going to walk us through it. The first thing we have to do is build the Isabel. And when we did this location piece in the dead house, I was very like confused by it because there was really no decision making that's happening. But after doing it with them, I realized two things. This first grounds us by going through this process card by card, building these locations. It really sets the tone. And there's also, in a very quiet year sort of way, um, a ritualistic aspect to this. I cannot wait to get these physical cards and play this game. Uh, because I think the only thing we're missing here is I think that there's an added layer to holding these cards and, and making the decisions and physically putting these down. So I am gonna start. Um, I'm gonna draw from the boat deck. Now you'll notice, um, let me just bring it over here. We've got several locations that have been put aside by, per the instructions in the game. We're gonna see them come into play in a little bit. There's actually only four locations, one for each of us. So I am going to draw the first location and let's flip it. All right, the boat deck. This is the boat deck, an open area at the rear of the Isabel where the business of fishing is done. The dories are stacked like pancakes upended on the taffrel here. 
Looking forward past the wheelhouse, there's a magnificent view of the spread of two gaff rig sails. Put this card at the rear of the Isabel next to the cabins. So I'm gonna go ahead and flip this and I'm gonna say this is the rear uh, of the Isabel and I'm going to quickly put our dories under it as instructed. And then Joe, I'm gonna draw the next card for you. Mm -hmm. All right, cabins. These cabins for the master and his passengers are compact, tidy, and safe for the permanent and unavoidable smell of fish that permeates every corner of the Isabel. Quite pleasant. Uh, put this between the uh, put this card between the boat deck and the fore deck. All so. right. So I'm going to flip this back over, and I you can uh, Joe, if you want, you can put that where you'd like. Um, I'm figuring the fore deck is to our right, so or I can move so. it. You want me to move it for you? Oh, you got it, Joe. All right, like. perfect. So there's our cabins. Brian, you are next, sir. All right. I will Let's take a bow. Flip this and re tell us about the bow. All righty. These are the berths where the mates sleep in cupboard-like rooms and its hammocks for everyone else. The various lockers, chain, sail, forepeak, are wedged in wherever there's room. The cook, Lestenkoff, prepares meals here, which are consumed with gratitude or trepidation. <laughs> I like it. Uh, put this card at the bow of the Isabel next to the foredeck. All right. So, so it's going right. to, I think, go over more to the right. Yeah. There it is. All right. Last but not least, Nick, you have the foredeck. All right. <clears throat> this is the foredeck, dominated by the hatch over the ship's hold, currently stuffed to bursting with salted cod this is where the business of sailing is done put this card between the cabins and the bow right so i'm going to put it right there for you oh you got it all Perfect. right good so now we've got the isabel built next we're going to start finding out who's who's involved here so i'm going to bring up the people i'm going to give them a quick shuffle there are 12 of these cards, so we're each going to get uh, three. And keep in mind as we do this, we are not, if I draw, like in, you'll see here, I've got Lilith first. When I, when I draw Lilith, she's not my character, right? She's a character all of us have, but well, let's start. Let me just, I will bring her up and I'm going to flip. Lilith Towns, I have been called to this work to bring the teachings of Jesus to those who toil in this forbidding wilderness. And my husband, husband David will build my church in Sandpoint on Popoff Island among the Aleuts and the Russians and the fishermen. I am passionate, but presumptuous. Put this card next to the cabin card and speak Lilith's truth. So we're gonna see this prompt throughout the game where we speak the truth. This is an optional piece where I now, as the person who drew the card, have the ability to add truths to Lilith. And I'm gonna to choose to do that. So we know she is passionate but presumptuous. She's going to this island um, from a calling from Jesus. I, what Lilith doesn't tell us is she has not been religious her entire life. There's something very, very dark that happened to her in her late teens um, that almost ended her. And coming from the other side of that is when she found religion and she's been a zealot ever since. So I am going to go ahead and put her in the cabins. Joe. I'm going to draw Harris for you. Mm -hmm. And I would like you to tell us about Harris. Uh, Harris. I would be anywhere else if I had my druthers. But, like the cogs in a wheel, I require the money this trip will bring to realize my further ambitions. Laugh if you must, but I wish to be an actor. So, it's fish heads for me. 
four months aboard this leaky tub, I am ambitious but cynical. So I think the the truth about Harris is that initially he kind of took this opportunity um, for this particular boat uh, because a kind of for this kind of air of getting life experience for a role he is going to be playing and having been aboard this ship this uh these long few months and uh being kind of driven down he's he's looking for he's looking for something else anything else mm -hmm. brian you're up next you're gonna tell us about kenneth i'm gonna flip right. the card for you and make it <coughs> big all right I've never been out of sight of land before, and it thrills me. Here I am, the son of a tar boiler on a grand schooner in Alaska. I am excitable, but unsophisticated. Uh, put this card next to the four deck and speak Kenneth's truth. So Kenneth, obviously young, not very experienced. Literally everything that's going on here is new to him. Um, he's also not especially bright. <laughs> and I feel like some of the crew are, are probably treating him uh, almost more like a mascot in some cases. <laughs> he's, he's kind of like an excitable puppy. You, know, you can get him to do all kinds of stuff. He's not very good at it, but he sure is enthusiastic. All right. Nick, you are up, and it looks like you're drawing brown. So let me flip it for you. <clears throat> and I'd like you to tell us about brown. Brown. As second mate, it falls to me to manage the business affairs of this accursed scow, and our business is fish. So I do the same work of all the others, and I count cod tongues and keep a tidy receipt. I am fair but harsh. All right. Put this card next to the four deck card and I'll speak Brown's truth. Let's see. So, Brown's truth. Um, he is the second mate. Um, yeah, let me bring it up for you again. Yeah. No, I, I can see it here. Yeah, we're good. Um, Brown is actually specifically requested to be on this boat. He was primarily a second mate on a uh, uh, another boat that made a lot more money. It was much larger and had a, a lot more uh, capabilities of, of pulling in large quantities of fish and for some reason he is on this boat uh, he has some sort of weird calling that pushed him to mm. kind of volunteer to, to be the second mate on this on this uh, ship all right I am next and I'm going to draw homes I'm a simpleton, but my heart is as sweet as candy, and I'm glad to work hard among friends. For those that laugh at my infirmity, let God judge them. I'm likable, but careless. So we've got a himbo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> these guys, oh, I struggle with these characters because I immediately fall in love with them. <laughs> uh, Holmes, as it says, um, doesn't ask much, and it doesn't take much to, for for Holmes to feel um, happy. He finds the joys in the smallest things. Um, he's been on this boat for a while, and for the first time. He feels uncomfortable. And I think the reason that Holmes feels uncomfortable is because of, because of Lillis. Lillis has immediately targeted Holmes and decided that um, Holmes not being a, a man of God is unacceptable. She is taking very much advantage of his potential ease at being influenced and there is something that Holmes knows he doesn't like about her 
but he's such a good-hearted person he can't quite square that circle in his head he just knows that he feels very uncomfortable and it's ne something he has really never felt before joe speaking of lilith towns let's talk about david mm -hmm. towns all right da -da 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 -da. david towns my wife lilith is a genius who positively burns with the light of the lord and it is my role in this life to assist her in her ministry I myself am nothing, but Lilith has been guided by the hand of God, and I will in every way ease her path, even if it takes us to the frightful backwaters of Alaska. I am clever, but demanding. All right. Um, so I think David's, uh, David's truth is... Uh, Kenneth is our uh, second mate who is kind of taking care of the logistical side. Uh, David has been pushing, starting off very subtle and becoming increasingly more insistent that Lilis should be allowed more of the meager uh, uh, comforts that this mm. boat has to offer and has been constantly pushing and pushing. Um, starting from a place of you know believing the best of of his wife and is now just erring into making kenneth's life difficult kenneth or uh brown i think brown is the paymaster here oh yeah, yeah brown yes is the, uh, second mate, yeah all right so brian you are next and you are going to tell us uh, about yes. Lastenkoff, the dreaded cook every morning i am up at three baking bread as much to mask the stench of bilge water and kerosene as to feed the crew and passengers i hate cod but i love my job and i love men i am cheerful but manipulative Ooh. uh put the card next to the bow and speak Lastenkoff's truth so, Lestenkov really does seem like he's doing this job out of a, a genuine joy in it. He likes, um, you know, he likes being at sea. He likes being around people. He likes feeding people, uh, to use modern terminology. That's one of his love languages is, uh, you know, providing food and that sort of thing. Um, but he wasn't always a sailor, and he's here to get away from something that happened to him back on land. You know, he doesn't talk about it. He's very cheerful whenever he's around people, but when he's sleeping alone at night, he's a little restless and uncomfortable. Was he a cook, Brian? I think so. He was. Okay. Or a baker. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you are up, Nick. You're going to make me pronounce. Okay, Mercury. <laughs> I was going to say, you're going to make me pronounce that live on air. Uh, I'm first mate and a loot. The Schumigans are home to me and I know them well. But I left on a ship once and now I don't belong there anymore than I belong in San Francisco. I am steady but lonely. Ooh. Yeah, Mercury Leaf. Um, that's interesting. Uh, I think Mercury's truth is that uh, oh, it just disappeared on me. Dang it! Um, long here more than San Francisco. I think Mercury is looking. It has a strong desire to find that uh, uh, companionship, and mm. uh, is missing something in life um and is just continues with with his day-to-day -day work but in has a constant desire to find somebody to connect with and to uh, uh enjoy the the fruits of his labor with and that's his driving factor at the moment and is that what where that sense of not belonging is is driven from is that loneliness do you think i think so yeah Oh, I 
totally missed where he goes. Sorry. It's the bow. I didn't read it all. The bow? Okay. Uh, oh, no. Put it next to the boat deck card. Oh, and oh, speak. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, boat deck. Okay. Got it. All right. Ooh. I have got Miss Anne Nickerson. The deal I made with my mother was that she could send me to whatever blue stocking finishing school she wanted. If I could spend the summer aboard the Isabel with my father, she agreed and chose Miss Brackett's school in New York City, which I shall hate. I am enthusiastic, but sheltered. Anne has spent most of her life with her mother, with her father being on the boats uh, for most of his career. And proximity to her mother has also driven her to just see the worst in her mother, even though as um, superficial as her mom can often seem, her mom truly has her best intentions. And her father's aloof. Um, he's focused on work. He defines fathership as being a provider um, as opposed to being a parent. And Anne was not ready for this. She was not ready for the reality of it. Uh, it was romanticized in her head, but now after all this time on the Isabel, she realizes that this is, this is drudgery and this is awful. And to make matters a little bit complicated for her is that she has gotten Holmes's attention or I'm sorry, Merc uh, Merculeaf's attention. So he has got it in his head that he should be with Anne and that Anne is this person mm -hmm. that um, he's been looking for his entire life. Um, in 1888, the age difference is less um, creepy, <laughs> maybe, or <laughs> more, more allowed, still cringy. Um, and, and she has no interest in him. Um, but she does have an interest in somebody else on the boat. Joe. Hmm. Gordon. Oh boy, I love this already. <laughs> the universal truth of human nature is that we are all craven, mendacious fools. So it is not to form too strong an attachment in close quarters. Uh, best not to too strong attachment in close quarters. I will keep my peace and drink my own whiskey. I am competent, but perpetually drunk. <laughs> <laughs> so we've, we've got a philosophizing drunk. Oh. I, hmm. I think that, um, I don't know why picking on the towns but <laughs> it, it seems to fit for this I think that um, that Gordon believes that the kind of enforcement of the, uh, the the structured church is going to weaken the bonds that uh, is is going to weaken the actual effectiveness of, of the ship itself mm. like Preaching that sort of bond and brotherhood to to his perspective, and giving people I don't want to say giving people hope, but giving people something to look forward to should the worst happen makes them soft. I was super excited to play this game with these people, and now you see why. <laughs> <laughs> Brian. You have somebody that looks like very important. Ah, so he claims. Captain Nickerson, I am master of the Isabel and make my money when we're a happy crew and heavy with fish. 
On this journey, against my better judgment, I have brought my daughter Anne. She wanted to see the world, and this is my part of it, and the fresh air at least will do her good. I am calm but troubled. He's going next to the cabins. So I think he is a a good man. He's a he's a competent captain. He's a good leader. He takes care of his people and his crew. I feel like he's not entirely happy to have the Townses on board just because they're sort of an unknown quantity that are disrupting the balance he's established. And I think he's also increasingly aware that with Anne being the only sort of young, unattached woman on board, there is potential for a lot of uh, disturbance among the crew, let's say. Um, he's doing his best to keep an eye on her and keep her in her cabin most of the time just to avoid um, too much interaction with the the rough semen that you know what I mean I do. finally got that <laughs> <laughs> bingo. mark your bingo cards um, yeah. <laughs> so quick question Brian um, we, we got a sense of you know her perspective on her father mm -hmm. and one of my truths was the level of parenting he has been a part of has that changed at all now that he has now spent more time with her on this boat than he has for her entire life? I feel like not maybe as much as, as either of them might have expected because he's still, I mean, he's busy running the boat. Yeah. Um, he doesn't have as much time to spend with her as he's like. And honestly, because he spent most of her life on this ship, he doesn't really know what to do with a daughter. Yeah. So I think he's having a hard time trying to be parental in the midst of the difficulties of, of running a ship like this. And like, yeah, but... being, being fully parental, like trying to be parental, but also like trying to keep her as far away from everyone else as possible, kind of like links to that strain. For sure. Yeah. Uh, and real quick, um, just so everybody knows, because I didn't mention this, what Joe just did is well with allowed in the rules, right? So any of us can add to whatever the person who drew the card is. Now, Brian drew that card. Brian has veto power, right? So for this period of time, Brian controls the truths. So if for some reason, Brian didn't really like what Joe said or didn't think it fit real well or has some other ideas, Brian could say, you know, no, thank you. Um, and, and we can go on. And that's something to keep in mind because it's true through all of this. So the whoever draws the card owns the card um, and we can all embellish it. You hear me doing it with questions um, a lot. But uh, whoever draws the card is the is the final uh, final vote. Nick, you have our last character in this amazing cast. All right, Portugal. My name is Ernesto Batista Macabalong. Do you know how hard it was for me to shuffle these to make sure you got the hard names? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, Jesus. Um, <laughs> and I am not Portuguese, but I am also not a man who catalogs his indignities. I've been on the Isabel since she was christened, and she has been sadly neglected of late. And I think this will be my last jaunt aboard the old girl. I think so. I'm too. experienced, but fragile. Oof. Put this card next to the bow card. Experienced, but fragile. Fragile. Um, Portugal is uh, got a kind of a uh, an odd hatred towards the uh towards ca the captain nickerson because of the lack of maintenance and support and uh general caring of of the boat and and uh some of the people on on board um and he's he's fed up with with the situation and this is why it's his last but um he also has night terrors Mm. And I'll just leave it at that. So I have a quick question. What did Portugal think about the captain bringing his daughter on this particular uh, uh, run? He 
he that has es- elevated the the hatred um <laughs> because she took uh one of the one of his lifelong dear friends that was was on this uh boat for the same amount of time took his spot on this ship uh, since she's been there and yes. that person was also handy and and was kind of the the the, the maintenance hand and the, and the deck hand and... <laughs> oh that's good nick that's good all right we can now hide the people card so now we've established the, the isabel we've now really built these cast out and and i tell you having played this desperation engine now a second time something i didn't think about with the dead house but i was keenly aware of it as we did this the order in which you draw these cards mm-hmm. has a bigger impact than i think i realized right oh, no. by who, how we establish these relationships and as we get to the later cards so much truths have been established that it's it's very interesting and and one of the things that I've been really spending a lot of time thinking about with this game is is the uh, replayability, and I just keep seeing more layers to this game that add to the replayability, So, uh, which is exciting for me. So now we're going to go into the prompts. So I'm going to go ahead and shuffle these up. We have I have already removed, blindly removed two cards from this. So there's two cards we are not going to see. Um, obviously, it's done randomly, so the next time we play, we could see those cards. Again, these are going to be prompts. So whoever draws the card, whoever's turn it is, is going to read this, but it's not assigned to anybody. So this person is going to do two things. Whoever draws the card assigns it to somebody. And then again, has the ability to embellish it with their speak, their truth. Um, So I'm going to go first. So I'm going to draw the first one. First days. We are somewhere off Akaretan Point on Unga Island in this miserable gale and the Isabel is taking on water. I was tasked with wrapping our bow in a sail to stem the flow. And what worked until we stopped making headway. Now the pumps can't keep pace and this ship is doomed. No doubt in my mind who said that. And that is going to be, is it, I think it's Portugal, right? Portugal, this is mm-hmm. he's the last the trip, old, right? Yeah. 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 All right. So that One is- One week from old. retirement. Yep. All right. <laughs> yep. So kind of in his last, you know, this is, this is also like just, again, you know, the resentment towards the captain, the, the, what we have, we have this useless child on board when when my good friend would have never would have made sure the isabel was in shape for what could potentially happen and now we're going to pay the price and we're going to lose this ship and i think what frustrates him as well is the noise being created by the towns the towns (laughs) trying to explain this as you know this is god's plan God will guide us through this as he is the one trying to save the ship, wrapping the bow and the sail to try to stem this tide. These two dippy doos are, you know, trying to, trying to, you know, try to make it sound like faith somehow is going to make this difference. So I'm going to put this right under Portugal. Joe. Mm. Oh. Better days. Oh, there you How go. lovely. <laughs> uh, better days. I sailed with old Captain Turner aboard the Porpoise when these fisheries were a novelty 20 years ago. We took 16,000 fish in two weeks. Of course, now I am among a less grand class of people, weak and timid people, who go pale at a little weather. This ship is sound, and I'm not going to wet myself over some rough seas. So someone who, someone who's been sailing a while and um, is has has kind of seen this sort of thing and uh, believes believes that they can make it through. Um, So I think. Oh God, I've got to remember. Um. Give 
Okay, but I'm, I'm just looking at... Yeah, take your time, man. <laughs> now, one piece, as Joe's going through this, one piece that's kind of missing here, too, which I'm interested to play this in real life around a table, is normally the three of us would not know anything about this, so Joe would read this to himself, make his oh, decision, and then say... And says this, and then would read mm -hmm. it. So, um, which again is something, it's an aspect that I'm not going to really understand the impact of until I do it. Um, and there's just really not, not a real way to do that here. Okay. I am going to give this to uh, Mikey Leaf, someone who is lonely because they have bounced around ships and, you know, kind of taking. Uh, taking that loneliness and like that is more prevalent in their mind than any actual risk to uh, to the ship itself. They've seen this sort of thing before. This is fine. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe, maybe it is that attitude that keeps them lonely because they are adrift from people while everyone is dealing with the problem with the severity uh... it might need. <laughs> is is Merculeaf's uh, in full heart is that impacting his optimism at all yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i i think it is this like this this attitude that something i've been searching for has come to me already mm. so no matter what happens good things are good things are coming love it <laughs> everything's coming up mark you leave <laughs> <laughs> all right brian all right. Uh, tonight we dined on what are called Scotch dumplings, which are cod stomachs filled with cod livers and cornmeal. Cod, cod, cod. <laughs> we left San Francisco with five kegs of beef on board, but somehow that was gnawed through before we reached the Shumigans. Lord, am I sick of cod. <laughs> um, I feel like um, this is probably going to be Lestankov. We've already established that he hates cod. And I feel like as the cook, he was probably, you know, trying to delay as long as possible actually cooking any cod. So he went through the beef maybe a little faster than he should have when he was putting the menus together. But now he's at a point where, you know, it's becoming harder and harder to put a smiling face on this because of all the goddamn cod. <laughs> How much... How much does his work define him in his mind? So him feeling like, uh, you know, I am failing, right? I'm now I'm just cooking cod. Does this impact him, how, how he feels about himself? Or does I, he I separate don't, the two? I don't think he thinks he's failing. Uh -huh. I think he's just like, uh, you know, um, well, this, this trip has gone on maybe a little longer than he expected. Um, you know, and he's just like, well, now we're in the miserable part until we get home. I did what I could with what I had. I, I, I think it kind of rolls off his back. He's just annoyed because now the kitchen always smells like cod, too. Got it. Got it. All right, Nick. Speaking of cod. <laughs> cod business. You catch a fish, you cut out its tongue. That's as good as money. The master counts your tongues. You get $30 for every thousand codfish. Dress the cod you've caught, form a line, the header lops off the head, and the splitter opens the fish. And the salter, well, salts it and throws it in the hold. Work together and keep your own tongues. Oh. Um... I think this is going to be... Kenneth and Kenneth being kind of a, a unsophisticated, uh, unsophisticated man. Um, his focus is just doing his job. Rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, wow. rinse, repeat. Um, because he's in charge of counting his own. Um, let's see form line uh, work together and keep your own tongues. He is excited to be there, but he is definitely worried that someone is shorting him. Mm. He is concerned that 
he's he's not a mathematizer. Yes, I'm speaking as him. Um, <laughs> he, he's not good with numbers and 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 is Ciphering feeling is like he's for. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and he is concerned that he's being shorted on his uh, counts, and so he's trying to figure that out in the midst of going through this the seas and and dealing with the people on board. So it's it sounds like Kenneth is dealing with a, a certain degree of paranoia. Yeah, absolutely. And just because also, you're paranoid doesn't mean you're wrong. Go ahead, Brian. Right. I was going to say I feel like you know he's he's young and he's enthusiastic, but he's also pretty inexperienced. So I feel like they've got this whole assembly line process set up, and he's just slower than everyone else because he hasn't mm. done this before. And so the rest of the people in the crew are kind of getting frustrated because he's slowing their work down and potentially costing them money, which might certainly, in their mind at least, justify if they were ripping him off in some way. So if, in fact, tongues are being lifted uh, mm -hmm. from Kenneth, we have a potential way that it's being justified? At least in the minds of the of the thieves. And he's an easy mark. Mm -hmm. Yes. He doesn't know what he's doing. Yep. <laughs> All right. My friend, you just never know with people. I mean, a lifelong friend before the Isabel had cleared the Farallons, and we remain inseparable despite our obvious differences. On a ship like this, it's good to have a friend. I try to be a good one. I think here's where I'm going to reveal who Anne has had her eyes on. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Buckle up, kids. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. I did not mean to flip it. So, David has comes from a large family and a good Christian family. Um, and he and Lilith have been childless despite best efforts. Um, she's not even taken child, right? She's not even yet to be pregnant. Um, David's not sure if it's him. Not sure if it's her, not sure if it's God's will um, that they should be focused on on spreading God's word and not be distracted. And he, in a very paternal way, has taken to Anne. Um, it started off with um, him showing Anne um, how to how to fashion out um, whittle with wood and he, he made her little dolls which was which were you know she's way outgrown dolls but it, it was it was just like he as a provider right and he just he's bonded to her it's a very honest paternal connection unfortunately Anne feels differently. She doesn't see it as paternal. And part of what feelings Anne is having for David is driven by how much she hates how Lilith treats David. And the one thing, you can say a lot of things about her parents. I can say a lot of things about her, the, the Nickersons. But the one thing is that her mom and her father always respected each other always treated each other as equals and treated everything as a partnership. So that was her template. And what she sees happening with the towns, um, as a young girl might do or a young boy might do, she has a fantasy where David falls in love with her and realizes that, you know, what, 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 what love could be and what a relationship could be. Oh, 
<laughs> so romantic. Mm. I, used to, I used to think the towns have had the most access to Anne because oh, the cat has been a... keeping everyone away, yes. and like that's that's a married couple. There's no like, there's no possible way if they're people of God. There's no possible way this could. That's a hundred percent correct, Joe. Great call. <laughs> Great call. Speaking of Joe, hey, <laughs> affection. I stole someone's wood woolen nippers and there was a fight about it. You can't hold a line without nippers for long. I stole their nippers because I like them, and I long for connection, even if it is only hard blows. Bad weather brings out the worst in people. Oh boy. Who's stealing clothes? Now, I remember something coming up. Um, I just need to quickly double check who it is so um okay might might be reading uh too much into this but i'm going with it so uh, leston cough is doing his best to provide keep keep everyone safe and um he he sees that uh our <laughs> our actor harris He's, he's drifting apart from everyone else because he feels like he's above, but also cannot deny the the attraction that is that is there. And in this weird roundabout way, Lestikov steals these woolen nippers in the hopes that it drives Harris to him to, mm -hmm. to rather than doing any manual labor, like take up work as like a cook's aid oh because he doesn't have the nippers to be out in yeah. the, uh, up above Ooh, that's interesting now it, there it sounds like there was a fight between harris and kristinoff based off of what was read there is this a situation of pulling pulling the pigtails in the, in the schoolyard that any attention is better than a, than yeah I, I i don't get the the impression especially for the for the time period that um uh you know that that sort of relationship or that attraction between uh, two men is like as as well considered as we we think of it today. <laughs> so it's it's falling back on a lot of like childish reactions and how people would deal with those those emotions. All right, so I've got I got two more questions. I'm not done with this. I'm, <laughs> I'm in love. With this. At what? How? How aware is Lestikov of his feelings? Does he know that he is attracted to Harris, or is that something that, at some level, he is squashing and rationalizing? Yeah. I think I think he does because he has heard stories and tales of, uh, you know, my my lady back home, all of that, and has never really never really felt that and kind of internalized that as you know I'm very focused on keeping people keeping people happy and you know with the profession it tends to be a lot of men in the field. And this is the first time that has uh, crystallized from just, I want to provide to, I want to be with this person. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. All right, Brian. Hmm. There is nothing worse among a small crew than the outrageous turpitude of the moral coward and teller of lies. Someone has been telling lies about me. Very egregious ones, too, and I know who it is, and they will answer smartly for their careless words. Well, I know who is saying this. I just don't know who they're saying it about mm. yet. Hmm. And I don't think you're obligated to say who that is, necessarily, Brian. You hmm. welcome to, though. Might be, might be more fun to keep it a secret. Okay. Uh, but this is definitely Lilith. Yeah, she definitely feels like the people on this crew are not giving her and her husband the respect that they deserve. You know, they're saying just foul, crude things about her, um, and she is going to make someone pay for it before this ends. So another is, thing that oh, go ahead, Joe is 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 the secret that has been bandied about is one of the people on the crew. No, knows Lilith from 
before Ooh. she joins the church. That could certainly be it. I think I think there's enough stuff, enough cards ahead of us that we can kind of leave that undefined as yet. Yeah. I like that seed planted there, but I don't think we need to commit to it yet. I love it. I love it. I love it. So something else that um, that I, I find really interesting is, again, the order of these cards, right? How, again, we are as we build truths, it's influencing the, influencing the next card that's being drawn. And it's something about something that um, I think um is very easy to ignore and i think it's a big deal the more i'm playing these now the bigger of a deal i think it is mm -hmm. all right that was brian this is you nick all right <clears throat> a point of interest i don't want to cause a panic but the isabel is a bad ship poorly cared for and overloaded and we will be very lucky if she makes port the deadlines are secured and everyone will do their part and yet I fear that Isabel will slip away beneath us and soon. Oh, I th think we almost touched on this already. Do we add to that same truth or do we get someone else involved? It cause panic if Isabel's a bad ship, poorly cared for and overloaded. Actually. Oh, let's see. Um, Who doesn't want to cause a panic, Nick? Who is uh, obviously extremely optimistic? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going through the descriptions of the characters now. I'm trying to. Uh... And there's no rush, Nick. In this in this phase, these prompts as you're as you're watching, this is where we really set the scene, right? So we have laid out the the boat, we have laid out the cast of characters, and now we're establishing Act One, which is every but this is where everybody is. These are what the relationships are between everybody. We've planted a lot of potential, right? There's a lot of built up potential here. You're gonna see how things escalate. We've got two more decks of these to go through. Um, and the not only is the quality of the prompts high and that it gives enough detail but leaves so much to the person who draws it, but the escalation, I think, is excellent, especially knowing that Jason had to be conscious of not being able to dictate the order of these cards. Um, so hats off on that. Yeah, we're, we're setting up literally a house of cards at this point before right. we start knocking things down. I also, I also really like from, from watching The Dead House and from uh, reading this, like, it's it's written by the same person but the tone mm. is so different like it's mm -hmm. written from very different perspectives despite running the same engine and basically accomplishing the same goal which yeah is, I, I, that's a great point joe this doesn't feel like dead house to me mm -hmm. uh this definitely feels different which is good mm -hmm. so nick who is our optimist who is sure that everything's just going to be fine <laughs> um you know I, i'm actually kind of leaning um and, and bear with me. Um, a point of interest. I'm actually going to put it towards Gordon's truth. And uh, Gordon being a drunk, but aware of what's going on. Um, he is aware that stuff is kind of crumbling around him and things are not being cared for. Um, but the alcohol keeps him from really causing the red flag, but he will go on these tangents and ramble a little bit about the maintenance on the ship and what's going on. And nobody takes him serious because he's just a perpetual drunk that just mm -hmm. runs his mouth and gets really, uh, 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 nobody takes him seriously. Yeah, nobody takes him seriously, and he just kind of owns it. And the alcohol keeps him from really, you know, uh, uh, raising a ruckus uh, about this. So, 
So if I'm, and tell me if I'm capturing this right, Nick, it sounds to me like Gordon may not be an optimist. He might just be a drunk fool. Um, and, and the, the alcohol and everything is preventing him from seeing the reality. Well, I, I don't, I don't think the card actually sounds that optimistic. He says, we're going to be lucky if we make it back to port. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, I think he sees it exactly. Oh, he says, the I way fear that the Isabel will ship. Yeah. yeah. Slip away. Okay. Good. Oh, I don't, yeah. I don't know why I thread that so optimistically in my head. <laughs> no, that's a good point, Brian. Good point. <clears throat> All right, same moi. I think this Good might be our last so. round. <laughs> Sailors spend their time baiting hooks the size of their hands, 1,600 of them to a line. They bait them with whatever fry they can scoop up, squid, capelin, and it is a filthy business for filthy men. I could never love this life, but no one can deny the money is good. Hmm. <laughs> Now I'm I'm getting the vibe that you were talking about during the the dead house, Greg. Which is like, I know where I would put this. Card, exactly. Yeah. But I meant to mm -hmm. see what mm -hmm. you do. Yeah. <laughs> really interesting aspect of this game. It really is, and it gets more intense as we ratchet things up. Um. Hmm. It made them with whatever fry they could scoop up. It is a filthy business for filthy men. I could never love this life. Um, I think it's Harris. I think it's Harris. And I think it's Harris because obviously it, it, it reads to me as someone who is distant from this life, right? Which fits for Harris. Um, and his inexperience being here, his dreams of being elsewhere, being above all of this, recognizing it, that this is filthy work for filthy men, but the reality of the fact that he needs to do this work. So that's where he, that's where he, that's where he's pinning his everything on is, is, is the money. This is why I'm here. Um, and when he is alone, that's what he keeps telling himself. I am not one of these men. I am not a, I am not a, a, a man who, who works a schooner. What really made things interesting, though, is when he no longer had the clothes to work above deck. And when given the opportunity, and it was the captain's suggestion of helping out in the kitchen, he latched right onto it. Um, and while he was in the kitchen is when he found his missing clothing and realized who did it mm -hmm. he's stuck here now he's stuck here working with a man who took his clothing who um he's already had a physical altercation with joe yes Ooh, oh, ghosts, ghosts. Fine. <laughs> excellent ghosts uh, I have heard that the Isabel was an un, uh, was unmastered in the Tempest back in '85, and her crew washed away. And the ghost ship was towed to port and repaired. I feel in my bones that she intends to wash us away too. There is death about her. Oh boy! <laughs> Plot thickening. Mm -hmm. Love it. And oh, well, while, while I'm thinking about this, this is so interesting because if this came out first, then right. all the tragic Whole things different we vibe. believe, <laughs> yeah. Oh, heck. Oh, and this is our last card. Oh, cool. I'm gonna take a big swing then. All right, go for it, man. Yeah. Okay. So. 
the truth, and who this is attributed to, is that we haven't put anything for him. This is so good. Um, is that Captain Nickerman was aboard the ship? He believes that when the Isabel was unmasted, he passed, and is doing his best to leave something for his daughter. Does he know he died? Or is he beginning to question that he died? Not that he died. He believes he passed. Okay. So it's something that he believes. He believes that that he passed then. And now this is his last. Oh, my God, Joe. That's so <laughs> effing good. <laughs> oh, my God. That is so good. <laughs> <laughs> it explains bring it explains bringing the daughter on. Um, oh, thank you, thank you, Jason Morningstar. <laughs> oh, God. That's, Joe, that's gold. All right, so I am gonna go, go ahead. I'm gonna hide the whole gale, and I'm gonna bring up what is the card that um, basically you would put at the bottom of that deck, right? So it inevitably would tell you we're now transitioning. I'm gonna read it. Um, but it's going to be Brian who starts off the next one. So this is an event that always happens, and it happens after we get done with the Gale cards. Choose someone. Or actually, Brian, this is going to be yours, but you're also okay. going to be able to start the next one. So go sure. ahead. Abandon ship. Choose someone to lash themselves to the wheel to allow safe escape for the rest. Send them to the deep. Remove the four Isabel ship cards and spread out the four Dory cards. Divide the remaining survivors unevenly among the four Dories as they hastily abandon the ship. So someone's oh. going to die in sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And I will get rid of these. Mm -hmm. Well. I see two ways this sacrifice can go. I mean, on the one hand, given what we just revealed, I almost feel like it could be Captain Nickerson mm. getting his daughter off the ship as, as he founders down with it because he considers himself already lost. Mm -hmm. But I also think that he's seen enough of the, the rough men on this ship that he doesn't want to leave his daughter in their tender care. So I think he's going to keep going. I think actually hmm. I think it might be Holmes uh, why is this not wanting to enlarge for me I'll just see man that works yeah I feel like I feel like Holmes is going to lash himself to the wheel, and I feel like someone else on the crew... You mean Brown? Uh, no, I mean Holmes. Oh, Holmes, okay. Uh, our, our poor little simpleton. Oh, I think... We're I losing think, our oh, himbo. No, I think no. somebody... I think somebody, and I'm guessing it might be... Um, it might be Brown, basically said, just, you know... Just hold it for a minute while we get everybody in the boats and Looking left it in there. Yep. Oh, I think that's good. I think yeah, that's good. It is it is not to not to get too pop culture on it, but it's kind of a Hodor moment. Right. <laughs> right. 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 All right. So I am going oh, to Holmes is going to the deep. Take him and put him into the deep. So he is oh. Holmes is no moss. Right. So now I will let you tell me. Um you can start wherever you want. We've got one, two, mm -hmm. three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We've got eleven. <clears throat> Directionally, it says divide the remaining survivors unevenly mm -hmm. among the four dories as they hastily abandon ship. Okay. Well, um, I feel like the Captain is certainly not going to abandon his daughter. Okay. And I think. David is going to try and and be alongside Anne and I is like so the, so Dory one is going to be full with the Townses and the Nickersons. Okay, so I was going to like say, do you want to be on this channel again? If you did not 
put the Townses and Anne in the same boat. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that seems kind of obvious. I mean, we had to, right? So I love mm -hmm. that. So we've got the captain, we've got Lillis, we've got Anne and David and Dory one. Love that. I love the addition of the captain, by the way. Yeah. Um, I think um, we can put Harris and Lestenkov in Dory four, because they're obviously going to need to be together. But I also think um, uh, I think Gordon's going to be in there with him just to be a Why difficult third wheel. Okay. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. I feel like something horrible may happen to him as the others try and get, uh, you know, uh, get some alone time. Um, I think Kenneth and Brown will be together because... I like the idea of the young innocent and the calculating veteran. Uh, and then Merculeaf and Portugal uh, as the uh, the old guys, uh, you know, trying to trying to make it through. Although certainly Merculeaf wanted to get in Anne's boat, but there was just right. no room. Mm -hmm. Well, I think separating them is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And I think, and, and, and Brian, to your credit, I would have put, I would have made the mistake, I think, of putting Merculeaf in the boat with that because it's, it was obvious i think it's much better the father was a much better choice I much better get, choice. i think it'll get interesting oh i completely agree so we have set the stage <laughs> um we have now moved into what what is basically an act two right um and uh unlike the dead house where everybody was in town together i cannot wait and i have not peeked at these cards so i don't know what's gonna the separation here is fascinating the, the now the bifurcation of them across these four boats um, and the proximity to all of this, us having already had someone who has sacrificed, um, literally can't wait to see what happens. But I'm going to have to wait 10 minutes because we're going to take a <laughs> minute break. I'll see everybody in 10.
So now that we have set the scene, before we jump into In Boats, which is the next set of cards, um, there's 12 cards that come in the set. We've already, I've already randomly removed two, so there's just going to be 10 cards total. Um, this is our quote unquote act two. Um, very quickly. Um, and I'm going to gush. This is phenomenal. And we haven't even done anything yet, really. Um, you know, during the break, the four of us were just talking about how much fun we're having. And having played this Desperation Engine twice now, um, it's just so interesting, all the layers. It's on GameFound right now. It is not yet funded, and that is a problem. It's so a travesty. I'm, yeah, I'm going to quickly ask everybody who's watching this either live or, or, or in retrospect, if you can't back it, I understand that, um, even at the PDF level. But um, even if you can't back it, tell somebody about it, right? Is there somebody you think would have fun with this? Then shoot them, shoot them the link, because I am going to be visibly angry if this does <laughs> not get funded. Um, so, all right, I have shuffled the cards. Um, Brian, this is going to be yours to start well, off. Well, I don't know. I feel like I got at least a card's worth of stuff about right. killing someone and celebrating so i'm happy to pass it <laughs> all right so let's give this to nick then fantastic still together through the fog an apparition appears oh, shit. and it quit and i quickly realize it is another boat from the isabel the feeling of seeing another dory is indescribable we are ragged little or we are a ragged little flotilla we cannot raft together but we can spend a few moments and perhaps adjust our loads we are still together it gives me hope interesting move so your true survivors, survivors between two boats so interesting you get to reshuffle things a little bit who desperately wants out of their boat yeah who what are the I, I guess you have a lot of decisions to make here nick you got to decide who who this is have to decide what are the two dories and i'll move them next to each other and then it specifically says move survivors between two boats so i think we have to do at least one swap yep um to the point that was made why and we don't have to define why necessarily i don't think Um, so through the fog and apparition, realize sorry, moved it real quick. Uh, it's okay, you take your time. Another Dory's. which gives me hope. Okay, um, oh, Jesus. Think about again. Think about this being the first card. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Murky leave. Trying to remember all the little connections right now. Mm -hmm. uh, which would take your time, man. So I know who I would pick to say this. Um. And it's the swap part that I would would struggle yeah. with. Yeah, because I know who I don't want to get swapped. Right. <laughs> There's right. too much drama. Yep. So that's kind of what I'm thinking as well, uh, especially with what's been set forward. I, I want to try to keep that together, but part of me wants to throw Portugal on the captain's Ooh, boat yeah. to cause some, because he is so pissed off mm -hmm. about the maintenance mm -hmm. of the ship. And now that the damn thing sunk and uh, he wants revenge, but so the card kind of doesn't have a revenge aspect. Well, actually that, that's a question for you, Craig. Do we have to stick to the theme of the card as if uh, it gives me hope when this is an opportunity that might create uh, well, so here's the way I look at it, Nick, is that it's very, very ambiguous, right? I think the fact that we are still together 
can be the two boats. It could be who didn't get switched. It could be the fact that, you know, these two boats are close to each other. We could decide that, right? And the we is just that the that we're not alone. There's, I think there's a lot. I mean, something I think gives this, gives this person hope, but we are still together could have a lot of meanings. It could be just with one other person that they're in the boat with. Right. If, yeah. If Shakespeare has taught me anything, you can have hope for revenge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to um, bring Dory 1 and Dory 3 together. Um, and this truth is going to be... Uh, and 1 and 3? Yeah. Uh, this okay. is going to be Portugal's uh, truth. And I'm stuck on this, and so I apologize if this throws a wrench in anybody's stuff. But that is the nature of the game, man. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so 1 and 3 are together. Portugal's the one that said this. So he's the one that's going to have hope. Who are we swapping? I'm actually going to be pulling uh, the captain over to uh, with Murky Leaf. They're going to be swapping. So captain and Portugal are going to swap? No, captain yeah. and Murky Leaf. Captain and Murky Leaf are going to be swapping. Oh, okay. So captain goes with Dory that Mercury Leaf comes over here. Okay. Yeah. So and what happens? What happened here? So, uh, Portugal makes a, a a solid case of uh, needing to have the captain and and moving forward with. And my roll twenty just restarted. Oh, weirdly good. enough. <laughs> um. So, Portugal's. Uh, kind of uh, thought process here is to get one-on-one -on -one with the captain at all cost. Um, being on this boat, he's got hopes for paying back the captain for the travesty of the ship sinking that he spent so much time working with and the decisions that this man has made has, has caused this. So his uh, let me get to that card again. I'm so sorry. Take Still your time, man. Um, he makes the case to bring that he needs the captain aboard his ship to help uh, 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 survive and, and, and move forward and um, that between Murky Leaf and, and David they can handle their own on the other and uh, that Anne would be taken care of and is in good hands um, but he is in dire need of help and uh, the captain uh, obliges and Excellent. gives them a chance to be side by side with each other. And I love that this also gets Mercury Leaf on the boat with Anne. <laughs> it, so it's it's going to be a whole thing over in Dory One. And, is it Anne safe to say, David. Nick, that, that, that the captain is not aware of Mercury Leaf's feelings? Yes. I, I, I think that's safe to say, especially him allowing the swap. Right. Um, he's oblivious to that to that fact. Does he care? Because he's already gone. <laughs> My foot. In the chaos, a hog's head filled with salt broke free and crushed my foot. We didn't even notice, so desperate was our escape. Only now has it become obvious. The dull pain seems to rise in pitch and intensity, and with each roll of this accursed dory, I will probably lose it. You made this easy for me, Nick. <laughs> no question this is Portugal. And this is what was used to get the, the captain on there because the captain is the only one that has anything approximating medical experience, right? The, old, the, the, the captain always took care of things, always took care of a, a broken bone and set the bone and, and, and all of that. So um, the boats came close. Um, 
he had already primed Merculeaf to say, you know, I, I'm, I, I, this is getting worse. I need, I need the captain. I need the captain. As soon as he realized the captain was in the other dory. Mm -hmm. So primed Merculeaf. Merculeaf was not hard to convince <laughs> because that's the other boat is where Merculeaf wanted to be anyway. And I th feel like the captain was reluctant, but to what has already been said, feels that Anne is safer with, with the towns than with probably anybody else has no idea what Merculeaf is. And even if Merculeaf has bad intentions, um, the towns are there and he knows the paternal relationship that David has with Anne also makes it easier for him to come over. Um, I think at a, some level, he also understands, he also feels guilty because Portugal was right. <laughs> and, and so, um, that, that compels me from even more. I like it. Joe. Discomfort. The smallest things cause the blood to boil with rage. A body shifts and there is a grumbling. And then an annoyed little kick. And then, despite my exhaustion and starvation, I am fully prepared to tear someone's throat out for their outrageous insolence. There is a moment's hes hesitation, and then I collapse. We will fight again. Oh. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'm 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 hacking with Dory Four for sure. <laughs> Dory Four. And, yeah. And I'm actually. Yeah, I'm gonna give this to Gordon. Because I think what the truth of this is, is Lestenkov is doing his best to make this small little raft, this little island of salvation that they have, unbearable for Gordon, so that he and Harris are alone. <laughs> And that caused the conflict, right? Mm -hmm. And Just so, little, little needling, God. little moments of making, making Gordon uncomfortable. So now I need to know what Harris thinks about this bickering and Listkoff being an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is safe to say that Harris is because because of his inexperience, like, is just kind of he's playing peacemaker. Because he understands that these are two people who uh, uh, who have had experience on the ship. Maybe not in this situation, but he doesn't really process that. It's a, a boat is a boat is a boat. Right. We need all of us to be together. So he's often in the middle. And I think there are occasions where like that kind of boils over to like, you know, maybe a harsh word is said about Harris, specifically from Gordon about him not having the experience so it kind of feels like Gordon is Lostenkov is getting what he wants by playing the two off each other and like maybe adding fuel to that fire and the exhaustion piece is interesting too right so that adds yeah. an interesting layer to, to Gordon's situation this is going to be you Brian and, oh, oh go oh, ahead one please um, one thing I want to add about discomfort um, Lostenkov there was a stash of alcohol of course. that has gone overboard <laughs> oh dear <laughs> the death roll this sounds fun the vision is seared into my memory the Isabel heavy and low in a death roll she was broaching to windward on her beam ends and then the sails met the water then rose again heavy counter rolled and that was it for the Isabel it was a magnificent terrible thing to see speak your truth Hmm. Magnificent and terrible. I think the language used here makes it clear that this is an experienced sea person who is seeing this. Mm -hmm. Um. I almost... 
I think I'm going to give this to Harris. I think he's, you know, he's sort of seeing this with an artist's eye. Mm. You know, he's sort of viewing it uh, sort of in the abstract. And I think the fact that he was so distracted looking away, watching the ship, thinking about the ship failing, that may have been something of what triggered Lestenkov. Because, like, he's looking back and not looking towards where we are together now. I like that. Yeah, so I think Harris is still, you know, sort of like how I saw that. You know, maybe I could write that. I could do this into a monologue, you know, mm -hmm. something like right. that. And the Taking in like, all the hey, details. Hey, over here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nick. The stars guard me. <clears throat> in the half-light of the Alaskan dog watch, all the stars in God's firmament are arrayed before me for glorious inspection. Regal? 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 Regal is like a burning chip of topaz, and Terra's a fiery red. I am in great peril, but also in great company. The stars will watch over me, and I will survive. I feel it in my bones. Very interesting. Oh, who's, who's looking to the sky and the stars and weaving a, a belief that this is interesting? Uh, I think I'm going to stick to where my mind was going to take it. Uh, I'm going to go to our uh, GCB, our good Christian bitch, and <laughs> no, no, uh, Lilas. Uh, <laughs> nice. And, uh, uh, it, she is she is so heavily focused on this on on the sky and and thinking that it's a that it's God's will and not focused on the other things that might be going on around her on Dory one so here's something interesting and I'm not saying this because it needs to change but how interesting that we have two characters and who these two characters are that have had no truths. Mm -hmm. Everything is happening around them. Yep. All right. This is me. I believe so. Waking dream. Soaked. Salt encrusted. And freezing. I'm filled with anger. Bobbing helplessly among the North Pacific is bad enough, but I must share my torment with the worst person in the world, an intolerable jackass. I daydream about beating their foolish head in, then wake from my dreaming with a bloody belaying pin in my hand. Speak your truth and send someone to the deep. Oh, now it's rolling. Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> someone just killed somebody. Who's it going to be, Greg? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Last minute change. Last minute change. <laughs> so it was going to go to this boat. Mm -hmm. But the last minute change is who it goes to. Oh. Let's take off. Mission accomplished. <laughs> and Gordon just would not stop ridiculing Harris to the point where Gordon even blamed the fact that the captain staffed this with so much inexperience that started to blame Harris for this. And that's why this waking dream piece, Harris has never had something like this inside of him. Harris does not remember doing this. Listakoff 
didn't see the act, but woke at the same time with Harris over a dead Gordon. And Listikoff had Listikoff has 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 built this incredible fairy tale. And him being alone on the boat with Harris was part of that fairy tale. And now he's questioning all of it. <laughs> yes. So I'm sending Gordon to the yes. deep and Harris is a murderer. Ooh-wee. You ready, Joe? Yeah. The abyss. I'm falling like a shooting star now, but down through the depths, a weightless seraph. And I don't mind. Below me is the great Alaskan cod bank. We took one million fish this year alone, more even, but they still form a solid, undulating silver wall below me. A cod part to let me pass on my journey to the abyss. Speak your truth and go to the deep. Huh. 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 Right. So it speaks of God being a strange, almost focus, like someone who fell into the rhythm of everything they did being surrounded by cod and it is fitting that they see at first it's like a couple of cod kind of mount up they just kind of see in the crashing waves and I know how this works you take the cod you make the line and then those few cod that begin gathering in the ship begin to dim and this person they know where all the cod are they go to do their work and Kenneth goes to the deep so Kenneth just let himself fall out of the boat mm -hmm. I think his last words were there was the mantra that they would have on particularly hard days, something, some sort of rhythm to keep the line going. And the last thing Brown hears is that mantra being repeated, and it echoes out far longer as Kenneth drifts beneath the waves. So we have Brown in Dory 2 all by his lonesome. He just watched Kenneth just kind of I feel like Kenneth and uh, Holmes were kind of friends mm. and I think Kenneth knew what Brown did or at least Brown suspects that he knew so now he's kind of it. Almost, I, I, I want to suggest that Brown maybe feels like he's got both those deaths on his conscience I think that's phenomenal I think that yes. makes total sense like to it. me yes. total sense to me Brian. Okay. This has all been too much, and I am done in. Exhausted, sodden, and cold, my heart is beating out its final tattoo. When I'm gone, I hope I am treated with decency and gentleness. God damn, we're killing people off! <laughs> Look, man, we got a lot of crew to get through here. Okay? <laughs> we gotta keep rolling. Come on, right? Wrap it up. This show is not going to run forever. Like. <laughs> <laughs> There's no season two. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, my first instinct was was to put this on uh, on Portugal, but mm. I don't think I don't think I want to do that. I think I'm going to make things in Dory One really interesting. I think David Towns is not built for this. There's too much going on. He sees 
he sees Anne sort of huddled in the prow against the cold, and he, he sees Merculeaf just sort of eyeing her. His wife has got her eyes closed and is, is praying constantly. And there is so much he wants to do and so much he wants to say to try and get things right, to protect Anne, to help his wife. Uh, and he just, he doesn't have it in him anymore. And his just, his, his eyes close and he slips away. And it takes Lilith quite a while to notice because she's so busy praying. Oh. That's really good. Wow. <laughs> yes. That's really good. <laughs> you ready, Nick? Let's do it. Ooh, we got a survivor. And here is a rat. Spiky with block grease and evil to look upon. That somehow survived the calamity and has made it its way into my dory. I think we shall be friends. I do not need any more enemies. I love how these are written. So it's much. great. The writing is so good. Oh, interesting. Um, I've got mine. Don't put pressure on me like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's much easier when it's not on you, Nick. Oh, absolutely. That's the other thing I've yeah. realized. Yeah. Is it's super easy when you're the other other players. Mm -hmm. When it's yours, it's not. <laughs> not at all. Oh my gosh. All right. So I'm thinking this belongs probably in Gosh. Oh my god. I'm at a loss of where to where to put this now. Um there's a rat with block grease. Well, so there's a couple things, right? Um, I think the biggest thing is I do not need any more enemies. I think that's the most restrictive thing that I read here. Right. Well, uh, this is going to be Portugal's truth. All the buildup in the hatred, his foot, and the captain helping and doing his thing, even though he had a ulterior motive. Uh, I think his mind is kind of broken with all of the trauma and the shit that has transpired. And he is just going to let things lie. He's not happy, but he's not he's not looking for vengeance or he is open to just letting things lie and surviving at that point. So I'm going to throw some stuff out, Nick. Veto is needed. One, he wanted to lure the captain into the boat with bad intentions. The captain relieved the pain, fixed the, didn't fix the foot, but relieved the pain and Portugal didn't take action. Right. So now Portugal's like, it's going to kill this guy. Now I don't think I'm going to. And maybe he's questioning whether he should have done this at all. At least he would have had a friend with, um, with before the switch. Right. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's why he's bonding with this rat. Yeah, I like it. I like it. What does he call the rat? Oh, he definitely got to name the rat. Mm. Call Joe. <laughs> uh, 
it's going to be... Say Ratatouille, uh, you coward. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck it, Ratatouille. <laughs> 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 uh, all right. This is ooh. This is the last one. Okay. Too soft a word. I share this little boat with the principal architect of my ruin, the person whose gross negligence and criminal greed have brought us to this crux. The Isabel was rotten, and I must rub oil skin in cramped quarters with the very source of the rot. Hate is too soft a word. I know where it's going. I need to think for a second, though. She saw through this, or at least thought she did from the very beginning. This was never, ever about faith. It was never, ever about God. It was about stature, power. And now, any dream of being with him died with him. Anne is not a fan of Lilith. <laughs> and not only does she blame Lilith for being a hypocrite, for killing somebody who was so kind to her, but she's now in her head, rational or not, has decided that all of this is Lilith's fault. All of it. All right, that's it for In the Boats. Hmm. Joe, I'm going to have you read Landfall, which is the card that ends In the Boats. But um, we can decide, and actually, I'll let you decide whether you want to then take the next card or um, want to keep or want to keep going, because uh, we'll see, see how, how much how much is involved here. Yep. Right, a short last. The survivors make landfall and are perfectly safe. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, remove the four Dory cards and replace them with the two Shore cards. Place the survivors on the beach or in the Barbara as they might prefer. All right, so I'm definitely going to make you do the next card. <laughs> um, I'll do the. And as we learned in the pre-show, Barabara is a type of hut and not the repeating of what a bear is in Yowie. <laughs> <clears throat> I was assuming yeah. it was another ship named the Barbara. <laughs> Bar I'm gonna put I this don't read good. Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the Barbara, I'm going to put in the upper right-hand corner, the beach here. And obviously the Barbara is on the beach, right? But it's just mm -hmm. a question, Joe, who who's going to be in for now? So this, I think this hut. the the prompt was as they would prefer. Ooh, good point. So I'm I'm gonna take that as I think it's going to be. I think I should be able to. Oh no, that just picked everyone in that quarter. There we go. So I'm gonna take. Lilith being there makes a ton of sense. And I'm going to say that uh, the captain, of course, wants to keep and safe. And uh, Portugal's still recovering. Mm hmm. And then everyone else is going on the beach. All right, four and four. Okay, so. Next up is the last deck. And when you're setting up the game, you remove two cards from the hell deck. 
and you separate it into two even piles of five and five and you take the card that ends everything you put it in one half shuffle it and then put it at the bottom right so you're guaranteed at least five hell cards before the un the ending happens so the way i'm going to do this is uh, i'm sorry there's uh 16 or 15 cards so what if this end card end if the ending card comes up in the first eight cards we're just going to set it aside and draw another card and then we'll stop ourselves at eight does that sound fair because there's no way in the okay. world 20 for me to guarantee that the ending card is in the bottom half mm -hmm. all right hey thanks for coming faded quill uh you'll catch catch the replay all right so let's bring the hell deck out let's shuffle it they said we were perfectly safe <laughs> <laughs> and well, we are hell is now, others. Hell we is are other people. Now here, I'm gonna move the deep far away. And Joe, um, if it's okay, I'd like you to do this one as well. Okay. Can do. Mercy. Ooh, mercy. It is with the last of my strength that I make the effort to cut a throat with a cod knife. It is not an act of malice, but one of love. Oh. Speak your truth and send someone to the deep, or fail in your errand of mercy and go to the deep yourself. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, God, I've got two. I do two! <laughs> this is so good! Perfect card for the perfect player. <laughs> stop it, you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't stop. Don't stop. <laughs> I'm gonna steal your nippers. Mm. <laughs> Which, by the way, we figured out were gloves, not underwear. <laughs> yes, the information behind was very helpful. Mr. Morningstar, if you're listening, Nick's suggestion is a glossary of terms in the back of your book. <laughs> yeah. That could be read at a fourth grade level for me. <laughs> if, if you need a proofreader, Nick's available. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, so. Joe, this well, is huge. I, I know. I just don't <laughs> no want to make pressure. the wrong decision, but I'm committed now. Um, okay. <clears throat> What happens? All of this person's suffering can be attributed, at least in their minds, to one person. The person who brought this ruin upon them and the people around them, their family, family's business. And the mercy is so that she can't, now that they have found this brief gap of salvation, the mercy is that she can't do it again. So Anne is going to try to kill Lilas. And this is an act of love for the family, because for the family, for David. Yeah. Every, she is the root of everything here. But I don't think she manages it. Oh, you're killing Anne. Yeah. Bastard. Oh, so how does she... What happens? She fails? I think... I think in that moment of committing to this with knife the throat she for the first time maybe and she hesitates sees the face of the woman that David loved and Lilas reacts in the way that someone would when they believe their life in danger and defends herself so now for those of you playing the home game 
We now have Lilith. Did the captain see this? I think we'll find out with another card. Okay, mm -hmm. I like it. Because like it. <laughs> that's the f first thing. I'm like, holy shit, they're together. Mm -hmm. Ooh. <laughs> they were all probably asleep except for Anne. Oh, no, Anne's asleep still. Well, <laughs> technically, <laughs> yes. You ready, Brian? Bring it. <clears throat> I have a corrupted wound. And I have hidden it as long as I was able, but now it has gone black and foul, and the limb must come off. The thing must be done with a cod knife, and I suppose I will live through it. Hmm. I feel like this card is really well written because it really is. <laughs> it could be absolutely literal. Yep. Or it could be super metaphorical. Yep. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, Every hmm, one of these prompts hmm. has just enough detail. It's beautiful. It, it, it really is. Really beautiful. Huh. I think <clears throat> I think we're going to give this to Merculeaf. I think he Ooh. injured one of his hands during the during the flight from the boat. And the reason cuz he certainly would have wanted to stay with Anne or near Anne. But he went to deal with this out on the beach away from them because he didn't want her to see it. Because he he doesn't want her to think of him as less of a man. Oh my god, that's good. But she, but he's gotten to the point that he has got to, uh, you know, it, it, it's too dangerous. It's going to kill him if it's left untouched. So he he severs the hand and sort of cauterizes the stump in the little fire they've managed to put together and then um, at some point in the near future he's going to head towards the Barabara Bara to talk to Anne on a scale from <laughs> Kanye to Tom Hanks how crazy is he right now <laughs> oh oh he's he's um, um I'd say he's at about a Tom Cruise okay yep Nick, that was a great choice, Brian. I did not think of that choice, and it works. Well done. <laughs> Turnabout is fair play. We need food, and I was elected fisher. In a dory, after many hours, my line tensed, and I brought in a great, big, beautiful cod, the largest I've ever seen, easily 50 pounds and very lively. And somehow it knocked me over the gunwale into the ocean, and... To no great surprise. Oh shit. I am too weak to save myself. So that's weird. I wonder if somehow this is in the wrong deck. No, because I mean they still have the dories. Oh, they oh, sent the one out to go out. fishing. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right, 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 right. Okay. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to take that away from you, Nick. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh so who took the dory to... out? It's amazing when you draw these in go to the deep cards like the weight <laughs> yeah and, it, and it's it's, it's multi-level because it's it's the weight of 
having this control over these characters, but also knowing the impact you're having on the game. Um, and there's a really neat shared responsibility that I feel playing this that I don't feel playing Fiasco. Or for I the could, queen. I could kill this character, but I don't think their story's done yet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. or, or even so more so. Threats. Yeah, and when you play like Fiasco or for the queen, you're, you, you, what, what you're doing really impacts you, right? And your character, whereas here, I, I feel like such a shared responsibility mm -hmm. with the, the, the four of us. Uh, it's really sure. interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the pressure. Yeah. <laughs> <about too>. um, <laughs> I think it's got to be brown here. And mm. the Brown feeling responsible for Holmes and Kenneth is being the, the second mate. He was the, or he was the. Brown was the charge, second right? mate, yeah. Second mate, yeah. Um, having that responsibility and, and making the calls that he has, he wanted some alone time go out and, and and catch some fish and provide try to get up any bit of strength he might have had left and in the pursuit of trying to do a final deed for his uh shipmates um he met his demise so nick i am too weak to save myself is it physical or mental it's mental for yeah. sure for like sure. I deserve this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. He rolled too low on his sanity. <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I love this choice. Really love this choice, Nick. Well done. Does, does Brown uh, see because they both, the people that he feels responsible for, both died underneath the waves? Does he see their faces as he sinks? Oh, one. I feel like. I feel like in his mind, and of course, adjust this or remove it as you see fit. I feel like he can see the two of them swimming up to him and taking his arms and bringing him down. And it's not sh it's not clear if they're escorting him or dragging him down. <laughs> Interesting. I, really I was going for what if uh, what if instead of him catching a cod, he actually caught the body of one of his. Oh, oh I love it. I love it. Bigger than anything he's seen before. Mm -hmm. Pulls it in mm -hmm. in his mind until the last moment. It is a cod. That's what was happening. This is the biggest nice. cod I ever pulled in. Oh, I love it. One of the bo oh Jesus, Nick. That's it. Yes, yes, yes. I just <laughs> showed okay. my cards. Here's, I'm mentally sick, so that's here's the question, <laughs> Nick. Here's the question. You don't need to answer this, right? Because it's 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 I can argue for not answering this or answering it. Did he end up in the drink by his own doing or was it what he drug out that put him overboard or don't we really know Do, am I making sense like yeah it, yeah and I'm, and I'm going back <laughs> to the Drag Sopranos it. finale I, I think we'll <laughs> let it lie in the eyes of yeah, and leave it up for interpretation to what makes best sense for them. I like it, but yeah, I have something in my mind for sure. <laughs> for clams, someone who knows better told me not to eat the butter clams I dug up. Said they were poison, but I was too hungry to listen. I ate them all up raw, and now I'm wearing them like a filthy apron and coughing up blood and I can't talk right. And my vision is fading. I can't even remember my name or why I am here. Speak your truth and go to the deep. I need a 
to check one thing. Oh boy. <laughs> um Merculeaf rationalized this as him being really hungry. He was told by everybody. It was, and it wasn't him specific. Everybody's like, we found these clams and, and it was, and it was list off, uh, uh, Listikoff that made this clear. Do not eat these things. They are poisonous. Merculeaf knew what he was doing, but didn't want to, to, to come to peace with the fact that he's killing himself. So he created in his mind this un, this insatiable hungry, hunger. And she's dead. And he's done. So he just goes out there and gorges himself and really in his mind he's going to see her so this was absolutely suicide one less effort but but he's not he didn't have enough in him to 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 own up that he just killed himself right mm -hmm. Oh all right so here's the salvation card so crap how many have we oh, I wasn't counting we've had at least we went one round right cuz Joe yeah, started so it Oh that's right so we need to keep going then so I'm going to set the salvation aside. We'll probably do one more round. And Joe, we'll yeah, salvation. let's all do one more. So we'll, I'm, I will take the salvation card. Okay. Okay, so yeah. or no, it'll be after me, right? Because I get one more too. All right, so Joe would do salvation. Okay. Yeah, so Joe will do the salvation card. Sorry, so this is yours, Joe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the egg thief. Above our wretched shelter, vast screaming hordes of gulls, orcs, myrrhs, and puffins taunt us. They nest in the cliffs, and those nests contain eggs. I alone have the courage and stamina to make it make the attempt, and I scale half the cliff like a triumphant goat and eat my fill. There is no practical way down, and the fall is the end of me. <sighs> Kidding big lighthouse vibes from <laughs> the birds. <laughs> I think I know what I would do. I think. I... I know what I want to do as well, but let's, should we commit? Let's, let's commit. Okay, here we go. We're doing it. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> I feel, feel so sad to let this go, but it feels thematically appropriate, so we're going to go. Um, so. Knowing that this attraction is still there despite all the terrible things that Lesnikov has seen Harris do, he can't deny that this feeling is so strong that it could... Could it have driven Harris to do? Does he feel the same? Is this... Is this what true love is? Being able to make the correct sacrifices for your partner and Kolesnikov tells Harris one day that I know how we can stay happy and in a home 
together. And he walks off for food. And I think when he arrives at the top of that mountain, he kind of looks out from this view on the beach. And he sees Harris and he couldn't be he couldn't be able to see him holding this, but Harris has a length of wood that he is fashioning into something. And he knows that it's his choice or it's Harris's choice. And he makes his own choice. I'm there. Nice. I am there. I am really anxious to see who the F Harris really is. <laughs> Harris has become a very interesting character. Yeah. He's he's season my, my two vibe is at the moment. Bad Harris. <laughs> yeah, my vibe right now is he is an actor. Yeah. Okay. Brian, <clears throat> if we are to be saved, it will not be God or another ship who does it. So I gather what I can and load the best story, and I'm off to the rescue before anyone can object. Sadly, even our best story proves itself less than seaworthy, and now I am left splashing like a seal to no good end. Sharks are very abundant in the Shumagin waters. Okay, so this one is really more like who it's not going to be. It's not going to be Lilith, because she's counting on God. It's not going to be Harris, because he's clearly a survivor. It's not going to be the captain. He's already written himself off, so it's got to be Portugal. He's the one practical, sane, in quotation marks, <laughs> member of the crew remaining. So he is the one who decides he's going to save the crew or die trying, and he dies trying. I like that choice a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I also like to think that, like, as he's rowing away, this is sort of overlaps with the last guard. He sort of sees Lestankov up on the cliff and sees Lestankov just kind of look down and think and then just sort of let go and fall into the water. Mm -hmm. And he's looking at that when when the dory starts sinking. Yeah. Ready for your last card, Nick? Let's do it. <laughs> Regrets. I hear a groan. It is the moaning of the damned in hell. The Isabel had bad seasons in 86 and 87, and her owner neglected her maintenance. The signs were everywhere. She was a leaky ship, and she groaned in misery when worked by contrary seas. She is groaning right now, and it fills my head until I scream. This is a good one. It could go to any of them. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it has implications. I said it during Dead House. I think uh, Jason Morningstar really should think about uh, making a living at this. <laughs> <laughs> He's really good at it. If I recall, the captain in the ghost card, that was he, he was on that ship in, in 85. 88, 85, yeah, that's right. And, and one thing... And, and Joe, that was your card. So you say, no, Craig, that's not what I meant. Like Joe, I thought felt was interestingly nebulous about, and he passed. Right. And it leaves. He passed. Right. That's, and that's what's, I think that's huge to keep in mind. That leaves a lot. Yeah. I, I wanted to keep it nebulous in case anyone wanted to make the decision that he is actually dead or it's just mm -hmm. the psychosis. Love... So, yeah. Or his will to live uh, died, right? Hmm. He died of a broken heart. <laughs> I think it's got to be Captain Nickerson's truth um, because of the attachment to the actual ship itself and being the actual true seafarer here. Um, and he's kind of going mad already with where his mental state is and what he's seen transpire or actually has he seen that transpire yet well, he knows his daughter's dead right mm -hmm. yeah 
We have um, not defined whether he saw. And I think that's. Too. I think that's part of where the scream is coming from. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And so, him being there prior and knowing that. Uh, he neglected the maintenance because her owner, that's that's him. He's the, the captain. He was directly in charge of or he oh, he was the owner of the maintenance of that. Whether he was the financial owner doesn't matter, but mm -hmm. he was in charge of doing that and the, he is coming to realization that all of this has transpired because of his neglect yeah. uh, of the ship and focusing on uh, being a provider and just trying to maximize every dollar and not focus on the long-term maintenance of not only his similar to his relationship with his daughter but the relationship with his ship and maintaining yeah. that and once he's come to that realization which is right now knowing that he won't ever get a chance to fix that with his daughter he screams and just just it, it 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 tears him down and drowning in failure as a father as a captain all of those things nick i think that's really good absolutely Look okay at narrative intersection of mm -hmm. yeah the ship and the daughter you ready this is the last card before joe ends it oh boy <laughs> <laughs> i'm awoken to my own desperate shivering it is extremely cold because my partner in awful contorted sleep has died in the night. They have died in my arms as we huddled for warmth. Oh, there's so much I can do with this. Mm -hmm. And having this come at the end when there's so few characters left is fascinating. Oddly, Valentikov showed up. Harris didn't question it. And when Valentikov met him on the beach by the fire and laid next to him, he didn't question it. And there was a tenderness there that was unexpected and he didn't question it. And when no. he woke up and he was cold, not warm the way he would have expected to. And when he saw caved in skull he remembered seeing him fall from the cliff he remembered the reality that he went and got the body and dragged it by the fire and laid down next to it it didn't come to him he went to it and it just refused to even acknowledge that it was that he was dead And everything, everything overtakes him. And I think he picks up Lintikoff's body. And like, like he's a child, carries him. into the water for a true seaman's burial, right? But he just keeps walking and he doesn't come back. Can I give you a pitch? Please. The waking Harris certainly dies, but the dreaming Harris who held the belaying pin and dragged the body from where it fell 
is still out there. Yeah. <laughs> yep. 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 All right. Let's end this lovely flowery tale for me. Salvation. Schooner Albatross appears. Of course, it's Albatross. <laughs> uh, appears, and the beach is soon swarming with her cod dories. Survivors. Speak your truth. And what I'd like to do here is have each of us add a coda to this, if that's okay. And we'll start with Joe. think yeah yeah i think we're we're going to go we're going to go with the captain so captain nickerson is welcomed aboard the uh, the dory brought back to the albatross and is is treated with a little more kind of respect because he's the captain it's a, a terrible situation that is, has force been forced upon him and he almost sees the attention and the pity become cloying something he doesn't deserve he does not deserve to be protected because he couldn't protect what was closest to him and as they're sailing away towards this salvation one day just kind of out on the deck he spots something floating on the surf and he sees tied around a small wooden doll as was carved by a friend to a daughter. Tied around that is the flag of the Isabel. And in that moment, he realizes all of this was a test, an opportunity for someone who had died. A test that he failed. So utterly and completely through his own inaction and his own self-preservation, his own weakness and his own not being willing to let a daughter live. And finally, after these years, Captain Nickerson meets the end that was destined for him in 85. Brian? Lilas <clears throat> is broken. She knew with all of her heart and all of her faith <clears throat> that she was going to make this journey to, to proselytize among the, the Aleuts and the Russians and even the sailors. Um, and she had in her heart the thing that she never told anyone. She was convinced that if she had succeeded at this mission, if she had brought the faith here, that would have been enough for God to grant her the child that she had never had. Oh, Jesus. So she's just on the boat. Every shot of her, she is just pale. She's still. She has that thousand-yard stare. <clears throat> and she doesn't say anything to anyone. Eventually, they're brought back to to land. They got another boat, which brings them back to something resembling civil civilization. And as she finally changes out of the, the clothes she's been in since the Isabel went down, 
and gets some, you know, something from the, the poor house to put over her, her body as she tries to make her way back home. We see her kind of look out at the at the ship she's getting ready to go on and take home, and she just kind of reaches down and puts a hand on her stomach and then just kind of looks down and we cut away. <laughs> Wow. Nick, what's your coda? How do I how do I compete with those two? Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's not a, it's not a competition, man. Yeah, but I know, but that's amazing. Like and, and, uh, and it can be you can obviously you can pass Nick. You can also just add a little detail here, a little detail yeah, there, right? Actually, actually I have one detail that I'd like to, to add for Lilas and uh uh back in the beginning of, of our session and when they were on the boat uh doing their thing, uh people were spreading rumors about Lilas and she didn't know exactly who it was um, part of her during this whole thing. And, and as she survived and getting on the, on the ship, I think part of her is saying these people got what they deserved for lying about her. And sure. uh, she was there on a, uh, on her own mission and her own, uh, path and the people that looked down on her and, and were spreading rumors got what they deserved so Lilith and the captain get on the albatross and oddly We never see them on the boat at the same time. And we see the schooner reach shore. We see Lillis come off the boat on the dock. And as she does, we see the boat she getting, she's getting off is not the albatross. And then we cut back and to the deck and we see our captain. And we see him looking at the flag looking at the dial. And we cut away to hearing a voice, which is a young girl saying, see dad, now we've got all the time. We're going to go to credits. We'll be back. All right, real quick. Um, and then I, I I can't wait to talk to you guys about this. But first, um, go to Game Found. Um, it's Game Found forward slash projects forward slash bully pulpit games forward slash desperation. Just go to Game Found, search for desperation. This is going to come up. Uh, the physical copies of both games is. 
think $30. $30. Yeah. And that gives you the PDFs as well as the physical game. The digital edition is $10. And that includes the pre-release, the digital edition of both of both games. Um, there's also a retailer bundle as well. Um, right now, as we are broadcasting this, we are, or they are just over halfway to funding. And we've got 20, they've got 24 days left. Um, I've said it, I'll be pissed if I don't get a physical copy. <laughs> yeah, this, so, is, this uh, is a travesty, go back it. Yeah, yeah, and for a lot of reasons, because there's just so much here, there's so much more this engine can do. There's so much more that, imagine both of these getting more cards later, right? Uh, it's just, there's so much potential here. Um, Nick, you kind of, kind of came in blind. Uh, you did. You only watched little pieces of the Dead House. Um, what was the experience like for you? Uh, it was great. I mean, it's hard to come into something new like this in front of all the viewers and being recorded on the internet. Uh, so <laughs> you know, there's a little bit of pressure there. But uh, I think I learned a ton about the system. And this is my first narrative, full narrative game That's right. uh, and so really it's one thing to make a decision and let things kind of lie and see how that unfolds this is you're kind of doing it all we're all kind of our own game masters and i yep. have minimal experience as a game master and so it really got to flex that creative muscle and that storytelling muscle that i'm not used to yet but also knowing as things progressed it made it it was easier and i started getting to the vibe and seeing everybody and what they were doing and how they were elaborating and also once i realized that the cards were not literal that you can interpret them many different ways and roll with it however you want you don't have to pay attention to one detail and go oh crap well that negates half the people on there it was like well not really there, there's ways to make these cards work as long as it tells a great story when when i realized that i don't know what time it was but uh, it really opened up my eyes to this system and how great this was. And uh, th this was just fantastic. S Joe, was this your first storyteller game or do you, have you, had you done GM with storytelling games before? No, so I have done, um, I've done quite a couple of times over a series of different contexts. Once uh, the first time I played was like as a sort of drinking game. Uh, the <laughs> other two times I've played a lot of fun like you can take that game really seriously but then you could also just have a bunch of chuckle fucks mess around <laughs> um and then and then twice with two different uh role playing groups uh the other game that i i mean i played uh like one game of fiasco and the other game that i played is uh, a game called hearts blazing uh which Ooh. is about kind of making a sci-fi uh radio play yeah um so i am <laughs> i'm not like i haven't done this for a while um, like the, these types of games, because all the games I own of this are physical. And mm -hmm. <laughs> Joe, I, I feel like, and I don't know if I'm right or not, but I, for some reason, I feel like I see fingerprints of the Quiet Year on this game. Do you do you have a sense of why? Because I, I haven't been able to figure out why yet. Why why I feel like, you know, I mean, I mean, I don't know. There's something about the it's there's a piece of the Quiet here, Year here. Do you, do you know where I'm getting that from? Yeah, I think the main thing that really hit for me that was uh, quite uh, quite esque was having something uh, sort of tangible to set your story yeah. around, like having the board with the deep and then putting all the various elements on. Um, I think like it's being able to to build it and having um, like specific character cards and like having the prompts like that that definitely uh, swings it to a different direction. But I think having something tangible to set the elements of the story around uh, definitely feels very quiet here. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So Brian, who would like this game? Um, Gosh, I mean, it's interesting because games like this scratch a slightly different itch for me than they're they're like straddling the group between RPGs and board games. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think it's great for people who want to experiment with role-playing and storytelling without 
oh, I got to find somebody to be a GM and we got to learn all these rules and that kind of thing. It's literally, as you saw, you know, because we had Nick come in at, as, as a last minute replacement, you know, you can just you can just pick up the card and start talking through it and go. If you've got a couple hours, you can just take a group of people and do this. And I think it's the kind of thing where there has been enough you know, TV series and movies and books and elements that are mining this same type of storyline. Uh, I think it's, it's you know, it, it's a great way to sort of dip your toe in those waters without having to commit to a single character, a single storyline, somebody jamming and that sort of thing. Um, also, anybody who is at all interested in the improv side, uh, I think this is great because, you know, whenever we had a card come up, especially if it was a card that was sending somebody to the deep, it was like immediately, all right, I know who I would do that to. It seems obvious to me. And someone else does something different. I'm like, oh, that's actually really cool. Mm -hmm. Now I have to kind of recalibrate the mental map. Uh, so it really does sort of enforce that yes and philosophy, which is such a big piece of successful improv. So the, I'll close things out by saying one. This also could be a very. Oh, go ahead, Joe. I was just saying. I think this also could be like these types of games make for a really good tool for if you have a, a people who are interested in role playing but like haven't kind of committed to uh, mm -hmm. learning the rules like this is a good way to get those sort of juices flowing about describing actions and like I think you could even slightly modify it to be like if you want to just kind of take this one then I think Definitely. You you could definitely skip it to ways that it's not initially meant to, but kind of use it as introduction. Sure. I think hacks of this game are going to be very interesting, and I guarantee they're going to happen. I think that this oh. engine is. This I'm is, already putting a set of cards together yeah. in my head. Yeah. Um, everything I said at the end of the Dead House is true for me. Um, a few things that I've picked up on is. Uh, and, I, and I'm harping on it not because I think it's the major part of the game. It's just the part of the game that I did not digest until playing it now twice, which is the order of the cards are huge. And it's, so it's not just the missing cards. It's, it's the order in which things happen. And there's a very interesting funnel that happens as you work your way down these prompts and as, as things narrow for you. And, and it increases the impact as you go as well, which is just absolutely fascinating. Um, there's a detachment, but we all of us, like you, you gravitate to some of these characters, right? And the, the an exercise in improv is amazing, which is true of every storyteller game. I still contend that if if the subject matter is is good, for the, for the crowd this is a great quote unquote party game this is a great like hey let's grab some drinks i'm going to throw this out none of you know how to play this let let's just go and in the same way nick described it doesn't take long to figure out what's happening here and the, the prompts are just outstanding absolutely outstanding so um nick thanks again man for pitch heading anytime you know my number <laughs> um joe we got blades coming up uh at the end of this month um oops i killed a guy time to deal with some consequences <laughs> of that so and if you've not watched joe on our blades uh games joe's joe and the rest of the cast are amazing nick is on there too um and uh brian what do we have coming up oh gosh well we have some lovely delta green uh up ahead get uh get some folks dabbling in some present day horror yeah, uh and of you. course eventually yep run by me and of course eventually the return of the forbidden stream yes which yes. is on a bit of a cliffhanger right now <laughs> yeah we're not going to see that until june but uh boy oh boy um we <laughs> sure as hell with that um last but not least if you um again back this game but um tabletop talk the podcast please check it out especially the interview i did with uh mr morningstar um that uh um, I really enjoyed and I thought was very revealing and interesting. Um, he has a very definitive perspective um, and um, he is somebody who's had a huge influence uh, on this hobby. So I think it's, it's hopefully well worth your time. Uh, Patreon links, like follow, subscribe, share all that stuff. Um, I'll see you next time. Take care. Thanks all. Take care. y'all.
Howdy friends, thank you for watching. All our content is archived and organized in playlists on the Third Floor Wars YouTube channel. Check it out. And if you could like, follow, subscribe, and even set your notifications to this channel on YouTube and Twitch, we'd appreciate it and it'll make sure that you catch all of our content. I talk with creators, designers, and experts across the gaming landscape in every episode of our podcast, Tabletop Talk. Open up your favorite podcatcher and search for Tabletop Talk from Third Floor Wars. Support your creators. They make the content you love, and it's your support that makes it happen. If you want to help us, go to Third Floor Wars on Patreon.com, and you can help us for as little as a dollar a month. Thanks again. We'll see you next time. Take care.